finish up in chapter 5 and push as far as we can. I say push gently here as we continue to uh, study evangelism and perfecting the church. Uh, we left off with our Lord accompanying, uh, and I should say his disciples accompanying him on the Sea of Galilee as he was making his way and going to them over to Gadara. And prior to that, he had taught the great multitude by way of parable, and then the lesser that followed his disciples, uh, where he was alone, the mystery of the kingdom of God. And the day was far spent, uh, the evening had come, and he, that's when he made the announcement, let us pass over unto the other side. And they sent away the multitude, and he was already in the ship. And as you recall from last time, he uh, just got back there in the stern. And um, as the, the ship sailed, he just went to sleep. And in the process of time, as the Bible would say, it came to pass that a great windstorm came down upon the sea and beat the sea. It caused the sea to become, become very uneasy. And the waves beat the ship, and the water it just kind of lapped over into the ship, and it began to fill. And the disciples, experiencing this great event upon the sea, uh, couldn't help but notice that the Lord was still fast asleep. So they awake from out of his sleep, and he rose and rebuked, rebuked the, the wind and the sea, and that was a that was a great calm. And then he turned and rebuked the wind that was in the ship. Uh, this is the the voice of the wind of unbelief and fear in which his own had displayed in the midst of what is the perfect storm. A perfect storm would be a storm in which the Lord Jesus Christ uh, has orchestrated the uh, journey and that he was present in their midst. And here in verse uh, 40, he said, why are you so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? Now, I could understand if this was a voyage where the man Christ was just another individual going with them to the other side. And perhaps they may have known that he was maybe prominent among men. But he being who they knew he was, he wasn't a stranger, for he had preached the gospel of the kingdom of God. He was the one who said that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. And then he taught in their synagogue cast out unclean spirits, he healed uh, the leper, uh, and those who were sick, and he did other things that had to give them an indication that he was just no ordinary man, and, and they knew this, but it's amazing as to what a storm will do, it will cause, and cause their perspective to be seriously altered when it came to uh, who he was. What were they to learn from this event? I believe strongly that according to Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6, 
as it is written, I am the Lord, I change not. Uh, therefore, ye sons of Judah are not consumed. And then in another place, it says that Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, uh, today, and forever. This one who uh, is the Christ, the, the Son of the living God had his disciples there with him. Uh, and he was the word made flesh, and they were there in the flesh. And they had an advantage that we in the church have yet to experience, and that is, as he told Thomas, he said, you see, and now you believe, but blessed are they that have not seen, but yet believe. And what they were to understand in this, and Mark lays it down uh, really well, that in his gospel, just working his way up to chapter 4, that this one who's on the ship is the Son of God. That's Mark chapter 1, verse 1. And that he is also the Son of Man, and that he had been given authority earth to forgive sin. They, they need this. And that's Mark chapter 2 and verse 10. Uh, and that he was also the Lord of the Sabbath, which means that he's the Lord of the Sabbath. He's the Lord of every day. Uh, and that he is Lord of all. And that, that's, uh, I believe, Mark uh, chapter 2 and verse 28. Even the unclean spirits had made the announcement as to whom the Lord Jesus Christ by saying that he was the son of God. So he's the son of God. He's the son of man. He is uh, the Lord of glory. Listen, he's God. God was with them in the ship. And as we have become acquainted in the church, with this portion of scripture where he said that I will never leave thee, nor will I forsake thee. And, and that what's, was being worked out before them. So the grand lesson for them uh, identified who was asleep on a pillow. And that is the word made flesh. And the same one who had told Moses that when God's people had their back up against the wall of Pharaoh and his army coming after them and before them, there was the Red Sea. And he instructed Moses to you just tell the people to stand still. You see, you see the salvation of the Lord. And salvation, remember, is that all-inclusive word uh, that includes not only being found and rescued, but also being delivered uh, and then being made free, uh, but not free of the master because he's the one who's going to be with them. So the overarching message to them was as to who he was. Uh, the teaching instructed them even though prior to that he hadn't opened his mouth, he was still the master. They were his disciples. And yes, a great portion of his teaching was done verbally where he instructed them with the words that had been given to him by his father as the spirit of God had given him the unction uh, to um, say those words and really say mo no more than those. And to them, uh, they had the one who is the Prince of Peace on the vessel. And their response was to be as he was, uh, to be still. And beloved, I, I hope that you have uh, at least gleaned from this very familiar account as to what's happening outside of us ought not 
become mixed into us in such a way that we would relate to those uh, individuals or circumstances as such that if there's a storm out there that it should not become a part of us. Now that's something that's going to take uh, applying the wisdom of God uh, and that is just taking the truth of God's word and doing exactly what he has said and therefore they would be able to do as the Lord did just ride out the storm and that's what would have happened I believe the Lord he was warned uh, physically uh, because he was you know, the son of man he was still God but he had worked and labored in the kingdom's business and I believe that they deprived him even more rest for what they didn't know was on the other side of the promise that he made when he said, let us go or let us pass over unto the other side. <coughs> and church family, we need to uh, make sure that if we don't get anything from this message, is that the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is God and that in our vessel uh, where he dwell. He said, I am my Father. We will come unto you and we will make our abode. That's where he is this morning. Uh, yes, the far-reaching aspect of his universe, he's there and he's observing everything that is transpiring therein. Uh, when it comes to things that are above and certainly the things that are beneath. So, as we uh, turn now our attention to chapter 5 here of Mark's Gospel, uh, in verse 1, the promise, the promise that was given and Mark chapter 4 and verse 35 is realized in the life of his disciples. There's no question as to whether or not they would make it to the other side. They are there. Uh, so they came to the other side and then, uh, and as I have it here, Mark chapter 4 and verse 35 is fulfilled. And see, Beloved, I believe that that would probably be a good rule that we could maybe just use that when the Lord answers prayer, uh, when he gives us a promise, that's, yes, it's found in his word, but maybe it's worded a little different because your situation is what it is. And then when it is done, we should acknowledge not only that with great thanksgiving toward him, but also in the process of us waiting uh, to have that manifest itself. <clears throat> that would demonstrate our appreciation uh, to what it is that we have uh, received, our dedication as to who we are, his disciples, and his own, as God would put it, his own dear children. So they arrive in in the country of the Gadarenes. Now, we, when we posted this as far as the title of our lesson, and it will be two parts. We'll uh, wrap up the rest of it uh, on the other side, Lord willing. Is that the man from Galilee meets the man of Gadara? I call the man from Gadara a man on purpose. Usually he's not called that. And as a matter of fact, I, I've done it myself. But uh, when you, the Lord shows you better, then you're supposed to do what? Do better. So the man from Galilee meets the man from Gadara. 
And when he, this is Christ in verse 2 of chapter 5, when he was come out of the ship, and this next word is one that um, Mark used in this particular gospel 17 times. That was another word that he used also straightway. He was he liked that word, but that word really deals with time. The next word is immediately. Immediately. We all lost something this morning that uh, we may try to get it back, and it depends on what activities we had planned or what's expected of us going into this new week. We all lost an hour of sleep <laughs> that we're not going to be able to get back, uh, you know, unless you just went on a ticket. And you know what that might mean. You may lose then the time that you could be fulfilling the will of God. So, but this word immediately, you, you, you don't pass over it as just a word that's referring to something that is getting ready to happen. You have to realize that something has already happened. If you were to go back to uh, Mark's gospel, back to uh, verse 8 of chapter 1, I want you to see something. Remember, our Lord was on a schedule. Now let's back away from the fact that, and yes, he's God, but he's a king. So his time, and he's a divine king, he's the king eternal. His time is of the essence. He doesn't have any, may I say, free time to waste. His schedule has already been set for him by our Heavenly Father. Therefore, when the man from Galilee arrived, he meets the man from Gadara in a place where this man wasn't accustomed to being. And might I just pause right there uh, since we are the children of God in Christ Jesus. That what was required of him is required of us. It may not appear to you that and, and maybe it does but it's something we don't usually think about we don't have as much time as we think to do the things that we would like to do for the Lord no one understood this better than Christ he divinely maximized his moment when it comes to scheduling and being where he needed to be, he's the master of everything. So therefore, he's the master of being on time. And when he's not on time, believe you me, there's a lesson behind it. There's a reason for his delay, uh, which doesn't always mean that that is a denial on his part. The first time we see this word, we see it concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 9, and it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. Here's that word, that, the other word that Mark loves, and straightway. It's still another time reference. 
immediately, uh, without further ado, as we say, and straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open. And the Spirit of God, like a dove, descended upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. I just want to say this uh, God the Father can say this now. And this is going to cover his entire time on earth. Because he's no ordinary son. And let me come back to that and say it this way. You are not an ordinary son or daughter of God. But compared to Christ, there's a noticeable divine difference. So he could speak of the one that was always in his bosom, so to speak. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. They were always together. So he, he can say this about the one who, and as we've covered in Colossians and then in uh, Hebrews, that it was the Son of God who created including us, even when you look back into Genesis and you see that it was the Lord God that was the Son of God. And immediately, the notice this, and immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. There wasn't any time for John, his disciples, the remnant, that was looking for Messiah to come, to gather around him and to say, well, Master, let's go eat. Let's, let's just, you know, the rest, this has, been a, this has been a good day. Our Messiah said, no, he's on, a, he's on a mission. Now, here's a missionary, because I did have this somewhere in a note. Jesus Christ is the missionary. He is the missionary from glory. concerns Israel, when it concerns even Gentiles. It was the Spirit who driveth him into the... He's the one who sent him out. And I sure hope we don't miss this. You know who sent him for glory? After creation, the Lord rested from all of his works. But after man's work, and that is what I call the work of the flesh, where Adam violated a clear command of the sovereign, the Lord of glory, and I want to put it in an anthropomorphic sense, in a human sense, that he rose up from his lofty throne, rolled up his sleeves and departed the hallowed halls of heaven and descended down through two and forty generations being born of a woman being born under the law. Descending all the way down to a place that, if you think about it, is a cemetery. We have remains scattered all around the world. And not only on dry land, but out there in the sea. It was God the Father who sent him into the world. But it would be the Spirit of God who would send him into his ministry. And 
I've said it, it's going to be, I'm going to say it again. If any sending gets done within the church by those in whom God has sent and raised up from amongst the children of men, if we go anywhere and accomplish anything, it will be because of the Spirit of God who sends us. We see this evident. It's clear when the church was birthed and then it was on the move. The Spirit of God letting disciples know who goes with who, who does what. We covered this in the past. Do you think maybe the reason why we're not getting much done is because we're not necessarily hearing from him or we're doing what we may think we should do I asked a rather silly question in here Wednesday night is the church still in the world because just maybe three years ago the world said the church wasn't essential and therefore, you need to close your doors. So I, I just asked the question, is the church still in the world? Well, the scripture says that it is. And the church is. And if the church is in the world, where the work beyond sending is happening, is where the Spirit of God orchestrated. This was obvious in the life of Christ. He would wear you out following him. If you overslept, if you were like a late riser, or if you were wanting to say, well, I got to be home by a certain time, that did not alter his ministry. Because he had in view, as we said last week, the joy of the Father beyond the tree on Calvary. So his schedule put him exactly where he needed to be, when he needed to be there, and no windstorm is big enough. And all of the waves in the sea, bad enough. And that's not enough water in this world and in the world to come to sink a ship where Christ is on. I glance you, you're thinking about some situations in your life and you're saying, but I know of a situation that this thing right here, you know, I don't know about the Lord and this ship sinking business because if he's in it, it won't go down. <laughs> it's going, it, it may not look pretty. Doesn't mean that the wind not going to howl. Doesn't mean that you're not going to get wet. Doesn't mean any of that. But what you can rest assured of is that if he told you he would, that's a promise. He's going to fulfill all of his promises. So the first time that we see this word immediately, it has everything to do with the Lord and his ministry. And then his direction was to go out and be tempted. And then from that point, just know that he was on a schedule. Now this would be a good time for you to check your schedule. To see how you're living and how I'm living. If I'm living like I have all the time in the world, I'm going to have tomorrow. Because like someone said, I believe it was Dr. McGee, he said some people think that death is the other part of this problem. Because they've died. And because we haven't died, that we're going to be here. But 
eventually we're going to leave here. And I wouldn't want it to be, and I have to put you first, uh, but I do want to be selfish and put myself first, is to realize that I wasted so much time on myself. On my own fear and reservations, which led to, quite naturally, a hesitation to move into the direction of the will of God. Because that's, that was his question before they docked the boat. Wow, I was so faithful. You had no faith when you had the object of faith in the ship sleep. So this word immediately, it applied to him in this context. But over in the church, and as it comes down to you and me, it applies to us. You can remember right now the last time the Lord told you to do something, and you put it off. You, you say, I'll, I'll, Lord, I'll do that. Maybe you didn't even say that. You just, I thought I heard the Lord. I believe I sent some pressure in my spirit. He put some out on your mind to pray for. And you say, they are. Or oh, oh, we make excuses. All I'm saying to you, the Lord was on a schedule. It ended briefly, but I don't want to use it. It was cut off. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. It ended, but he knew it, it was going to end. You know you're going to leave here. So if you look back of your life to see, well, I don't really have a schedule for doing anything for the Lord. I just kind of feel like you know, along the way he'll tell me and I'll do it. But how do you, what do you mean? How do you know if it's him? How do, you, how do you know you're not doing what it is you want to do? Or what you feel like doing? Or what you believe you ought to be doing? Since you were created by the one who is unique to you. Everyone being God, he created you uniquely different from everyone. No one can fit into your mold of life. No one before you, no one after you. So, so if you can look back over your life to see, I see so many missed assignments. The only preparation you can have for the future is to say, I'm going to obey the Lord. Because he doesn't give us our schedule just like we covered that last week. Because we'd mess it up. We'd complain. But Lord, why is this? Why, why are you doing this? Why do you want me to do this? Because that's what we do. That's what we do. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman made under the law. In Daniel 9 and 26, Messiah, that's the one who is Israel's Messiah. He's our Savior. He's the sovereign. Listen to me. And this is the schedule in which the Lord Jesus Christ was on, and is still on. And 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression. That's 490 years a week here. It's referencing years. And to make the end of... Let me back up. Upon the holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins. And to make reconciliation for iniquity. This is 
just sound like something familiar. And to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seventy weeks and three score in two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. Verse 26. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. He's being he was sent into the world. That's Messiah. By the Father. He was sent into the wilderness to be tempted of Satan. Well, just don't leave you there. Where else he went, he was being led and guided by the Spirit. He could say that. I'm here. Not that he always said it. He was where he was because that's where he was supposed to be. But he knew that he was going to be violently cut off. Suffer the death penalty. That's what happened to Christ. So he wasn't in a hurry to, for that part, but he was in a hurry to fulfill all that was written concerning him. Because he had all of us, certainly the nation of Israel in view, but he had all of us in view. Daniel 9, uh, verses 24 and 26. But let, let, me, let me just put this part here because this, this ties it up really good. He's going to be cut off, but not for himself. He didn't do anything. We're, 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 we're the guilty, the nation of Israel, and even the Gentiles. He, as we saw Wednesday night, he tasted death. Listen, when, when, when you read that, you say he tasted it. You know, we, we know what it means to taste. He can, he, death, he died. A literal death. He was buried in a literal grave. And he rose from the dead, literally, in a uh, flesh and bone body. Back to Mark chapter 4. Five, I should say. So immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. And when we delve into this on the other side, you're going to see that that was nothing that we had any indication that this was a place where he would normally be. But by divine appointment and the Spirit of God orchestrating the things of God behind the scenes, the Son of Man is going to arrive and the man from Gadara is going to be right there in his presence. And beloved, I want to say this to you that when he came looking for you, he found you right where you were. If you're present, he was saved. And it didn't matter how I'm not downplaying that. And maybe things couldn't get any worse. Maybe you were like some of us. 
things you said you would never do. You had done all of them and then you found a whole another list of things that was beneath you. But he found you. And the Spirit of God revealed to you who you were. What your position was before God. Not what other people said about you. You cute, you fine, you handsome, you a hard worker. You know, you, all these things. No, no. You saw yourself in light of the scriptures. And when you saw that, if you have seen yourself, you haven't seen anyone look quite right. Who you look like before God. It, it would take you out of the upper class in the world, or the middle class, or even the poor class, and put you in a whole nother class of wicked folk. That when poor old sinners, former sinners, we're saints, we do sin. God doesn't write the book to the, he said, I got, you got folk running around talking about, well, we sinners saved by, I'm still a sinner. Well, you are a saint. You are a child of God. Now, if you sin, we don't have no books written to the sinners at uh, Corinth or the book of Ephesians or any of the letters. It's written to saints. It's written to believers. It's written to the children of God. And when you hear people talk like that, it's one reason or another, they don't know no better, or oh, that's their cop out. So they can drink and they can party and they can do all the things they ever did. But for the true child of God to know, I'm the righteousness of God. It's been imputed to me. It's not mine. I, I, I don't have any. He told me that my righteousness is as filthy grace. It's Christ. And that we are sons of God. God doesn't have any children who are sinners. But unfortunately, God's children can sin. I hope that makes sense. God doesn't have, he doesn't go claiming. How many families in your, you have the children of the devil? Because he was a sinner and a liar from the beginning. He had the children of God. That's it. That's no middle ground. You are out of one of those camps. You're not in both of them. And you're not, like, well, I'm not in either one. Yes, you are. And therefore, if you say you're not in either one, I know which one you're in. You're a child of the devil. But that's hope for you. We all were children of wrath. That was all of our resumes. And the problem, we couldn't do anything about it. That's what it meant to be dead positionally. We couldn't do anything. And our condition was that we were sinners. And there, here in verse 2, and when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. I see that where he lived was the tombs. I see that he had an unclean spirit. But what I want you to see is that he was a man. He was a man. That's, that's who Christ saw. That's who our Heavenly Father saw. That's who the Spirit of God knew. He wasn't the unclean spirit. Where he lived had everything to do with his position and condition. Because see, God created man. And God said, and as my former pastor would say, the usness of God. What is the usness of God? God, the Word, and the Spirit. Let us make man in our image. And after our likeness, that's every man, that's every woman, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, 
over cattle, over all the earth. Y'all got to get this. That, that, that was God's scripted plan for man, mankind. And over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. That's who Christ went to see. He went to see a man. what the woman at the well said when she went back into the city she told the men come see a man capital letters man the son of man what I don't want to get ahead of myself that's who Christ went to see and I, and I have to say this now because it's going to be said again that's what we have to see. We have to see one of my one of my favorite movies. That was a rapper in it. What's his name? Maybe I think it was the most deaf of somebody. Something like that. But the name of the movie, it was clean all the way through, which is something rare when we're in a movie. The name of the movie was something that the Lord made. And he had the skill to be the, a doctor, a surgeon. But the surgeon that was the like one of the major you know characters saw it, but wanted to do what people do, push him aside. Beloved, we are God's workmanship. I'm talking about in Christ Jesus. But those who are not saved, they still. A man or a woman. And when it comes to evangelism, we if we miss that, that's why our churches are empty. That's why we're, because as a man thinking in his heart, so is he, you're looking down your nose at someone because they live in what you call the projects. And y'all know how I feel about that. When we all living on a cemetery, there are graves everywhere. And because we're saved and we have maybe a quarter we can rub together, and we have a house or, you know, there are folk who live in houses that look down on folk who live in apartments. You have folk who live in houses who look down on folk who live in double wide trailers. Y'all may not know what they, they are. They're not two trailers, semis going up down the road, but it's a home for heaven's sake. A single wide. It's their home. Man, you want to get the small hair on the back of my neck, you know, all stirred off. Tell them, yeah, they live in that trailer. All of us, beloved, based on what we've done, we ought to be sleeping under a bridge. But y'all know y'all won't always say, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. And some of you are not saved now. So if you take out the what God did quality, evangelism looks exactly like what it looks like now. And we're not reaching for Because the Spirit of God knows what's in us. We've already said, she's a that. He ain't no good. They crazy, stupid. <laughs> drive folk by what they do. And I know I'm going to say it again, something close to it. Rather than looking at a man. Let us pray. Our Father and strong God, we we're so glad that we saw beyond our fault and saw our need. That no one had to remind you of your hand. When throughout all of eternity past, you had all of eternity stacked on top of eternities, and you may have made this decision in your own 
predetermined counsel with our Lord and your spirit in a moment. But you've had a long time to think about it. So much so that even back then that you had already numbered every hair on our head. Every hair. Which speaks of possession. That you would always own us one way or another to do with us as you must. And that all of our parts I'm thinking about right now some of the unsavory things I'm hearing, Father, in our neighborhoods amongst my own kinsmen of the flesh that are happening. And what we're saying in the church and what you're saying from a kingdom vantage point. All of their parts, just like mine, you, you said that they're all written down in a book. And it was you who knit all of us together. The one who obey the gospel as well as those who consider themselves unworthy of everlasting life and go the way of a Judas's carrier, go the way of Pharaoh, go headlong into destruction. Father, I'm praying that we would take what you have said this morning as dear children, that you, you're with us, that you will never leave us, you won't forsake us. That you are our peace. And you don't have to come into the world to prove it because you came into our life and you've demonstrated it. And that we can be still and ride out the storms of life. And to know from where you said we're going to go, you won't take us there. Because you've already gone ahead of us. We could probably learn, you know, probably, and we can learn how to better use our time to get up off of our shirt tails in the morning and get with it for the glory of God while we got the measure of health and strength and the soundness of our minds to do something for the Lord and to do exactly what he tells us to do, Holy Father. That we would see all men and women for what you did and not as to what happened in the garden always and what they do to themselves and then what other folk have done to them that we will see everyone as worthy because your son I can say it like this Holy Father because this is what you did you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then the grace of God went the whole expanse of the world where you would demonstrate it that every time someone obeyed the gospel that you would save them. And then you have left it upon us by your spirit that where your love went and your grace is gone that our feet go with the gospel. Until everyone in in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ declare that he is the Savior of the world. You've blessed us with your presence. And we are blessed immense by your spirit. We thank you now for these few moments in which we have spent in your presence. I pray for these who are here in the midst. For those who may not know you in sin. When it comes to the pardon of sins. And even those who are with us by way of this medium. Preach the masses. We ask now, Holy Father, you want to say more than I do. And when they are saved, they be glad that someone prayed for them. And therefore, I'm going to pray, according to the sound of my voice, that you would save the lost. We give you praise in Christ Jesus' name.